Good afternoon. This is Tina Pettengill from the Maine Public Health Association. I want to welcome you to the third webinar in our series. Um, and just a couple of notes before we get started. Um, the first of which that this webinar is being recorded. The second is that we are going to hold any questions that you might have until the end of the webinar. You will see a questions box in um, you on your screen there, and you can enter a question anytime that you would like. We will answer those questions, though, like I said, at the end of the webinar. We'll also have an opportunity um, for you to press the raise your hand button, and we can unmute you at the end of the webinar so you can ask your question live if, if you would prefer that. So both those options are available. We want to make sure people are engaged throughout the webinar, again, through either the question box or by raising your hand. As I mentioned, all participants will be muted throughout the webinar um, to make sure the background noise is low to um, eliminated and we can concentrate on our topic today, which uh, this topic is very important to MPHA and our members, and that is recreational use of marijuana. Uh, we are thrilled to welcome Scott Ganyan, who's, uh, I'll give you his bio in a minute, um, but Scott is uh, very well known throughout Maine and, and a leader throughout the nation on this topic. And I, like I said, we're thrilled that we have him with us today to take us through um, the dangers of recreational use of marijuana and kind of the, the evolution to of what's been going on throughout the United States in looking at this topic of potentially uh, legalizing recreational use. Um, so a little bit about Scott. He's a certified prevention specialist. Um, you may have heard of him because he volunteers as the director for a marijuana advocacy and education group here in Maine called Smart Approaches to Marijuana Maine. He's the director of operations at AdCare Educational Institute of Maine. And Scott currently serves on the Maine Substance Abuse Services Commission in December 15th, December this last month was appointed to the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration through the Centers for Substance Abuse Prevention National Advisory Council. In, Scott, in 2015, in October at our conference, Scott was awarded MPHA's Ruth Shaper Memorial Award for his outstanding work in this field and going way above and beyond his scope of work. He's also received Healthy Androscoggin's Will Bartlett Award and was the 2013 recipient of the Maine Alliance to Prevent Substance Abuse Prevention Award. Scott, in all of his free time, which I can't imagine he has any, uh, he also writes a drug policy blog for the da Bangor Daily News called Smart Approaches to Public Health. So I hope you all will look that up after the webinar is over and um, see, see and read some of Scott's other work. So again, I'd like to thank you to uh, our webinar series. This is the third in our series. Uh, we're going to be having several more, and at the end of the webinar, um, we'll pull up a slide that you can um, see what our ne next topic is around um, shared public health data and um, where we go from here with that. But in the meantime, I would like to give a warm welcome to Scott. Thank you all for joining us again. Um, and if you weren't here for the first minute, just a reminder that everyone is muted, but please feel free to uh, insert your questions in the question box or raise your hand and we will get to those questions at the end. So without further ado, um, Scott, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so very uh, excited and happy to be with all of you uh, this afternoon. Uh, and as Tina mentioned, with this webinar, basically we're going to try to look at um, kind of actually let's go right to the beginning here. Well, oh. okay. Um, so what we're going to do in this over, uh, presentation is do a little bit on the basics of marijuana. Um, I know folks on the webinar may be familiar with some of this information. Uh, but I just want to make sure we're all kind of starting from the same place. And do want to note that um, these materials are actually coming from the SAMS Marijuana Slide Bank that was developed by the Marijuana Work Group, on which I was a part of. Um, look a little bit at some main data. Uh, we, thankfully, we have some new data from the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey that we can look at. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, a recap from the Maine Marijuana Summit that we had in Bangor this past fall. There's some really great information that came from that. And then for the rest of it, we're really going to look at the sort of political policy landscape 
uh, here in Maine, but also what's been happening in other states um, as they've undertaken uh, what some call this experiment uh, with legalizing uh, recreational marijuana. So, and then try to leave some time at the end for, for questions and answers. Uh, so we're going to go through this and um, just know that, you know, if, if in this amount of time that we have, if you still have questions, please feel free to reach out to me uh, through my contact information, information, which I'll share at the end. Um, so did, first of all, I did want to talk a little bit briefly about Sam Main. Uh, many of you may have heard of us. Um, so Sam is Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Um, and it's actually a national um, group that was co-founded by Patrick Kennedy, congressman from Rhode Island, and Kevin Sabet, a former advisor to the Obama administration. Um, and basically, Sam kind of started up as the conversation in Colorado and Washington uh, was unfolding, and it's a sort of reaction to the somewhat one-sided um, conversation that was happening around there. It wasn't really a lot of talk about the science and the public health parts of, of marijuana, so it's really a reaction to that to kind of provide some balance. Uh, and then here in Maine, it's basically the same story. We kind of organized as the Portland ordinance was unfolding and kind of seeing that same uh, situation where the, the public the conversation was really one-sided in favor of the industry and how, you know, all the money it might bring in, but not, to, to, not talking about the science and the public health uh, pieces. So we have four main goals. The first and foremost is to inform public policy with the science of today's marijuana. Um, the second is to prevent the establishment of, of big mar marijuana, or we'll sometimes refer to it as big tobacco 2.0, because uh, in many cases we're starting to see the, the big tobacco playbook already uh, in play. Um, to promote the research of marijuana's medical properties so we can look at something that's non-smoked, non-psychoactive, and something that's attainable and a pharmacy and really goes through the same rigorous scientific process that every other medicine goes through. And finally, to have an adult conversation about reducing the unintended consequences of current marijuana policies. So wherever there's some undue stigma or, or barriers to employment education, how can we address those things? So let's start with some basics around marijuana and, and won't spend a lot of time on this because I think some of this will be familiar with, with many of you. Um, but so when we, we're talking about marijuana, we're referring to the leaves and the flowering parts of, of the cannabis plant. Um, the buds of, of that um, have the higher THC content, which of course is the, the psychoactive uh, chemical in marijuana that produces the high. Um, some common forms that marijuana comes in, hashish or hash is the THC fill secretions of the plant. Um, hash oil is produced by removing the cannabinoids from the plant material. And so THC is one of several cannabinoids. Um, CBD uh, is another one, which is non-psychoactive and is present in a lot of the sort of medical preparations. Um, and, and in the United States, marijuana, hashish, and hashish oil are all uh, uh, Schedule One control substances. So as you may know, marijuana is, is used in many different ways. Um, a common way is, is smoking it through a, a cigarette or a blunt. Um, it can be used through a water pipe, um, commonly referred to as a bong, of course, and then also orally ingested, which is something we're seeing um, in Colorado, the rise of the edibles and the edible market. Um, some of the common effects from marijuana are paranoia, short-term memory loss, relaxation, heightened sensory perception, laughter, altered perception of time, increased appetite, um, and euphoria. So those are some of the immediate sort of short-term effects of, of using marijuana. Um, so some other background in terms of the federal government. So the FDA does not get involved in ensuring the safety of, of marijuana be, because it is a federally illegal substance. So with these state um, policies around medical marijuana, there is no testing, there's no federal guidelines on testing those products um, to make sure they are safe and not contaminated. Um, I say safe in quotation marks. Um, and um, so the, th the third point kind of speaks to that is uh, issues around insecticides, which is actually something that Colorado is, is dealing with right now with a number of their products uh, being having to be recalled because they're finding that they're very high in uh, pesticide levels. Um, and then when we look at um, sort of black market marijuana, we can see that sometimes that, that can be laced with other substances such as bath salts, cocaine, um, and in many cases the, the person buying the marijuana is, is unaware of that. Some new trends we're seeing around marijuana use um, alongside the booming sort of edible market is uh, these 
this dabbing process, um, and some of the common names are called hash oil, butter, honey oil, wax or earwax. Um, and so this is a very potent, concentrated form of marijuana, um, and sometimes one dab can be um, equal to five joints or more, depending, again, on the THC uh, concentration. And then the, the bottom picture, you can see what it's, this device is called an oil rig, which is how the, the, the person um, um, uses the, the dabbing. Um, the other form is, is the wax, and the way this wax is created is it's using these highly flammable and volatile um, compounds like butane, very high concentrated, um, 70 to 90 percent uh, THC. Um, and this is currently a product that's legal in Colorado, and so very recently, um, until some recent regulations, it was something that was free to be made at home. And the process that's used is in some ways very similar to, to meth labs in terms of, again, the, the, the gases and things that are used. And you know, so one of the things we see in Colorado is a number of these hash oil lab um, explosions. Um, and for those of you who work in the tobacco world, this is maybe familiar as, as the vape pens or vaporizing devices, which work pretty much the same way as an e-cigarette um, liquid, um, you know, a liquid cartridge that has a THC in it. Um, vaporizing it to, to inhale. Um, looking at um, the impairment, so one, one issue around impairment in marijuana is, um, like other substances, is, is it's going to depend on the, the person. You know, the, the, the impairment can vary depending on the individual characteristics of the person, the dose, you know, how often they're taking it, um, the amount that they're taking it, certainly the concentration. Uh, the route of administration, there's a big difference between whether you're smoking it or consuming it. Uh, and then, of course, the experience of, of the user, if someone's using more frequently, it's going to take, like other substances, it's going to take more to uh, get the desired effect. <clears throat> and certainly what we know is that marijuana does have a significant impact on the brain, particularly the developing brain. Um, you know, it's, it's just the developing brain is just more vulnerable to the, the effects of marijuana. And as we can see, it can get in the way of things such as uh, memory, problems with processing information, for sensory and time perception, and then so not surprisingly, we're seeing that this, in fact, has um, some significant impacts on academics and, and the future success of our young people. Um, lasting impairments of so using more frequently or using high potency products. Some of the lasting impairment can include um, impacts on complex tasks, learning new skills, decision making. And then uh, similarly with other substances, there's other things that can happen when someone's using or under the influence under the influence. So, um, you know, some impaired decision making can lead to risky sexual behaviors or other behaviors that could um, cause harm or, or danger to, to someone or, or other people around them. And certainly driving is another uh, issue around impairment. And, um, you know, unfortunately with marijuana, we don't have the immediate technology we have with alcohol. There's no breathalyzer currently available to immediately detect uh, that impairment. So we have to rely on our, our DRE uh, capacity, a uh, drug recognition expert, to uh, to detect this. And so that's a conversation that's ongoing right now in Maine is to how do we, with our current medical marijuana policy, how do we develop some standards to be able to, to detect impairment so we're uh, not jeopardizing the safety on the roads. Um, one health impact, health impact I think that doesn't get a lot of mention in, in the conversation around marijuana is the impact on the heart. Um, so when we think of marijuana use, we think of, you know, it's something that kind of slows you down and relaxes you. Ar ironically, what's actually going inside our bodies is that it can actually increase the heart rate anywhere from 20 to 50 beats per minute. Um, so if you have someone who's at an increased risk for, for heart disease or heart issues, um, you know, using marijuana is going to up their risks um, that much more. Um, so, you know, research has found that it can um, have some significant impacts for anyone with a pre-existing condition. Um, another interesting piece around marijuana smoke is actually when we, comparing marijuana to tobacco smoking, um, marijuana actually is a more toxic, I mean tobacco smoke is toxic enough, but marijuana smoke actually has higher levels of carcinogens, tar content, and carbon monoxide. So actually in California, marijuana smoke is classified as a carcinogen, and you can see some of the chemicals that are, are found in, in the smoke of, of marijuana. Um, marijuana and addiction, despite uh, what you may hear in some of the, the public conversations, marijuana is an addictive substance, um, 
and you know we can see some of the, the hallmarks of, of addiction and dependence. Um, and there are definitely um, some physical withdrawal symptoms that can happen from someone who's particularly a heavy user that's that start that stops using. Some of those symptoms can include irritability, anxiety, um, disturbances in sleep patterns, appetite disturbance, and, and depression. Um, there's a lot of research and emerging research that's showing the links between particularly heavy marijuana use and, and some mental health conditions. Um, so those withdrawal symptoms, depending on how often someone's using, um, they can peak within the first two or three days, whether they're a particularly heavy user, you know, those can, can last longer. And certainly, again, the potency of the products that they're using is going to come into play as well. Uh, so marijuana dependence is actually the third most common uh, drug dependence in many parts of the world, including the U.S. and Canada, behind tobacco and alcohol. Uh, the risk of addiction for adults is about 1 in 11. For kids, it's 1 in 6. So that's a, that's a pretty high percentage. Um, and marijuana is often found as a primary drug of abuse in, in many uh, treatment admission cases. Uh, next, I wanted to talk, show a little bit um, of some of the, the, new, the new data we have from the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey around marijuana. Um, so the first slide looks at uh, marijuana in middle school youth. So we can see um, those who've indicated using marijuana at least once or more in their lifetime. Um, in 2015, it's at 7.2%. Um, those who say they've used in the past 30 days is about 4%. Um, those who say marijuana is very easy for them to get, should they want to get it, it's about 15%. Um, about 5% of middle school, main middle school youth say their parents are accepting or are sort of a permissive attitude if, if someone their age were to use it. And about one in three believe that there's no risks or very low risks from regular use of marijuana. And just to note that um, you'll see the differences between 2013 and 2015, um, and there's actually no statistically significant changes, so all of these measures are statistically flat uh, since 2013. Um, when we look at oops, high school, um, this number also, these numbers also haven't really changed since 2013, so we have about one in five high school youth who said they've used in the past 30 days. Over half say marijuana would be very easy for them to get. Uh, over 16% say parents are accepting of use. Um, almost 60% who have a low perceived risk of harm from smoking marijuana one or two times a week. And then over half have peers or view their peers having an acceptable attitude towards the use of, of marijuana. Some national figures on um, what we're seeing is, particularly with adults, um, the, the rates of marijuana use is significantly increasing. Um, and it's probably not too surprising uh, given the, the normalization and you know, the, the, the states that have come online to, to legalize and the more states that are looking at medical marijuana, and a lot of these you know, policies can be very um, sort of um, porous, if you will. Uh, so not surprisingly, we're seeing uh, significant increases in the number of, of, of adults and youth that are using. Um, another piece of data that's important to look at is treatment admissions. So what we're finding here in Maine is when we look at those who are under the age of 18, uh, two-thirds of them, um, when they're uh, two-thirds of those seeking treatment, for substance use disorder are indicating marijuana is the number one drug for which they're seeking treatment. When we look at adults, it's a significantly smaller portion at 5%. Um, you know, alcohol and uh, opiates are still number one um, in that area. Um, when we look at the secondary drugs of drugs that they're being admitted for, um, we can see about 26% of 18 and under, and then about 29% for 18 and over. Um, and interesting, uh, going back to the previous slide, um, when you lower that age to 14 and under, it's 100%. So 100% of 14-year-olds and younger who are seeking treatment for a substance use disorder are indicating marijuana as a primary drug for treatment. Um, next, just a few slides to talk a little bit about this um, marijuana summit that was in Bangor that was um, planned by Bangor Public Health and Healthy Acadia. Uh, Sam Main came on to provide to some sort of TA around um, some of the programming pieces. Um, one of the things that we did with this in gather, yeah, we had actually folks from all 16 counties and made many prevention professionals, and we wanted to take the opportunity to kind of gauge what's going on in the ground in their community. So one of the things we asked them to do is to do this brief uh, survey and to rank these different intervening variables and to rate how significant they are 
um, in terms of the marijuana issue in their community. So the, those variables we're looking at are the perception of risk and harm, um, the access and availability of marijuana, um, any issues with pricing and promotion in this case would be related to some of the medical marijuana uh, pieces, issues around policies and enforcement, a lack of awareness of, of marijuana and those issues, and then community norms around marijuana. So we asked them to rank that from one to five, one being it's not a significant uh, contributing factor, five meaning it's very significant. And what we found is um, throughout most of the state, the top three were the low perception of risk and harm, the community norms, and the lack of awareness. The one bit of variation is down in York. Um, they did indicate their issues around policies, I think particularly around ordinances, rose to a top three. And then um, in the uh, one of the other districts, um, at the central district, availability was listed as um, one of the top three. So, but by and large, um, that, those perception of risk and those normalization pieces are top issues. So we asked folks to share a little bit more about what that means and how that looks in their community. So around community norms, some of the things that we heard is parental apathy around marijuana is an issue. You know, modeling, 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 so that modeling, so that marijuana in front of children or in some cases actually using with their children. Um, and then the proliferation of marijuana commercialization and normalizing messages. So while we haven't legalized recreational marijuana in Maine, there's still a, a significant amount of um, commercialization that's kind of gone around, whether it's the head shops and the marijuana tie-in products, vaping rooms, um, marijuana-themed festivals and events. Um, and then in some communities, they're actually seeing these social clubs emerge for people um, with medical marijuana cards. Policies and enforcement, um, some things that we heard were challenges and barriers for law enforcement in enforcing our confusing laws, particularly the conflict between state and federal law. And then if you're in Portland or South Portland, you have the conflict between local, state, and federal law. Um, landlords and tenants looking for some clarity and direction on what they're able to do. Uh, and this is something we also heard a few times is the lack of leadership from the federal government, and again, particularly navigating those, those conflicts between state and federal law. <clears throat> and perception of risk and harm is, was another big one. So and you've probably heard of many of these. The idea that marijuana is safer than insert the drug, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, heroin, um, and parental attitudes along those lines that, you know, at least my child is using pot and not, you know, alcohol, tobacco. So that sort of pervasive attitude. The glamorization in the media and pop culture, and I think that's something we've probably all seen. Uh, and then as mentioned before, the sort of the rise of these marijuana-centered events. And then another one that was raised is um, just some anecdotal stories about some pregnant women in, in Maine that are getting certified and just the number of unknowns around that. And um, certainly the, the science we have now certainly suggests it's, it's a significant risk. Um, so I mentioned earlier that you know our, our first goal is to talk about today's marijuana. And um, when we talk, I, I say that because, and for a couple of different reasons. Uh, for one, today's marijuana is much more potent. It's not sort of your Woodstock weed. It's not uh, the, the weed of the, the 60s and 70s. The THC content has dramatically increased um, since even the 80s. Um, and so what that means is with greater potency, of course, a smaller amount, it takes a smaller amount to uh, get someone higher faster. Um, and this chart actually shows you how, how that's gone. Um, you can see it's steadily increased. Um, and I think that's one of the things we're seeing play out with you know, these le legalized recreational markets is a sort of arms race to create the more uh, potent product. Um, but here's the other piece of what today's marijuana looks like is the, the many different forms it comes in. And these are all um, pro pictures of products that are actually available in Colorado. Um, my, my counterpart that hits up the, the, the SAM group in Colorado um, brought these pictures uh, to a presentation he did last year. Um, so these are all marijuana or THC infused products that you could buy right now in Colorado. So you can see the fruit punches, the chocolate bars, uh, the fruity pebble bars. And these are all sort of things that if you took them and put them side by side by your non-THC equivalent, you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, so the Nutella, the marijuana infused sodas, um, your mile high candy bars, Easter cookies, um, and of course the colorful vape pens. Um, so 
as of the time of this particular slide, there were over 200 edible products available in Colorado, um, and you can see the numbers there, many different types of gummies and cookies, chocolate bars, granola bars. Um, and then not surprisingly, this is leading to, and I'm going to talk a little bit mo more about this later, but an increase in ingestions and exposures amongst very young children. So it's basically gone to, from a situation where back in 2006 you hardly had any of these zero to five exposures to now you know, almost 40 a year. And when you see these gummy bears, um, it's not surprisingly not surprising why that happens. And so Colorado has gone from 14th in the nation for youth use of marijuana back in 2006 before legalization to now they're the number one state in the country uh, in terms of youth use of marijuana. And this came out just recently. Um, they were third just a couple years ago. Now they're now they're number one. So clearly um, there's something that's playing a role here. And when you look at these products and see the prol proliferation of commercialization in Colorado, one can probably infer that that is having some kind of impact. You know, here in Maine, um, again, looking at the normalization piece, certainly we have the campaigns that are underway and some of the marketing and visuals that, and messages that come along with that. Um, you know, it, definitely one of the talking points has been the safer um, message that it's safer than alcohol. Um, also, you know, you, framing marijuana as, you know, the, the way to recover the, the rural economy, you know, the, the, the cottage marijuana industry. Um, marijuana equals jobs. Uh, you may have seen some of these if you have any of these marijuana festivals in your community, some of the marketing that goes along with that. Um, you know, these are supposed to be medical marijuana festivities, but when you see some of this imagery, um, to me, this doesn't necessarily scream uh, medicine. Um, and then along with the campaigns, we have things like the drug duel where, um, you know, a, a sitting police chief in South Portland was, cho was uh, challenged to consume alcohol with with uh, this legalization advocate in the in public setting. Um, and so what kind of message does that send? Um, and then you know, there's also you know, radio and other media in Maine that kind of use um, 420 imagery and, and um, terminology in their stuff. Um, and so this is one of the things we see coming from that. And this, this graph here is very, telling it's it's you can set your watch to this um, what this does this is monitoring the future going back to the 70s and charting you know the perception of risk of regular marijuana use amongst youth and then their use of marijuana and what you can see is whenever you see a steep increase in the perception of risk you see a, a drop in the use of marijuana amongst youth um, so these are almost mirror images of each other and so now we're in this period um, in in the past few years where the perception of risk again is starting to tank and marijuana use is starting to bubble up um, against a, a trend where all of our other substances, at least here in Maine, are going trending down. Underage drinking, tobacco use, youth prescription misuse, those are all trending down, but yet we're stuck at this one in five level here in, in, in Maine. Uh, so the next section, I'll talk a little bit about politics and policy. Um, so here's the landscape in Maine currently. Um, so back in 2014, we had the three municipalities that had legalization initiatives. Um, York didn't end up actually going onto the ballot. The Board of Selectmen refused to put it on. Um, they had some legal counsel that said it was unlawful for them to put it on there. South Portland, it did narrowly pass 52 to 48%, so they now join Portland as having um, one of these local ordinances, which, of course, in effect, are kind of symbolic victories in a way because state and federal law, of course, still trump local law, so they really haven't legalized, but, you know, they still have that perception. And then in Lewiston, it was defeated 45 uh, to 55%. A number of bills have been introduced in the State House. The latest was in 2015. Where actually, there were two bills that were eventually merged. Um, and in that last um, effort, the, the bill, like previous ones, were, were defeated in the, the state legislature. On um, this last one, it was actually 98 to 45 against, which actually is the largest margin uh, of defeat in the State House. So, you know, at least, you know, we hear a lot about the polls saying the overwhelming majority, you know, a majority of Americans are in favor of legalization. Well, at least in the state house, there seems to be a growing number of lawmakers who are against it. Um, and then, of course, we have the referendum likely coming in November 2016. Um, the signatures haven't officially been submitted, but I, and I think the expectation is that that will happen. Um, as you may, may know, it started out with two competing groups. 
um, but this past October they've decided to merge to work on one initiative um, for November. Um, and in case you're interested, I did throw in a couple slides about um, sort of the breakdown of the votes in South Portland and Lewiston. Um, and what's interesting is you could kind of track it against the bear baiting um, question. In fact, my theory is, and it may not be correct, but I'm holding to it anyway, is um, if the bear baiting question had been not been on the, the ballot, I think the initiative probably would have failed in South Portland. I think that may have drawn out extra folks that were in favor, but again, that's just my theory. Um, out in Ohio, this past election in 2015, they voted on marijuana legalization, um, what was called Issue 3. So it essentially would have created this marijuana cartel or monopoly of 10 producers that would have had exclusive uh, licenses to produce um, the marijuana for, for their market. Um, it also would have set some preferential tax rates um, into the Ohio, Ohio Constitution, so it, which would have prevented them from being changed. So basically, it's really installing this 10 producer monopoly. Um, so what's interesting is this was this uh, issue was actually pretty unpopular even amongst legalization advocates. Um, I think many of them thought maybe they were getting too greedy. I mean, one can argue that maybe they're all you know a little too greedy and profit driven, but. Um, although some did end up backing it, the Marijuana Policy Project and Normal did both endorse the plan. Um, and they even had a mascot, uh, Buddy, who traveled the campuses in Ohio to uh, recruit um, you know, the young people to rally and come out and, and vote for the initiative. Um, however, it did end up failing, uh, 65 to 35 percent, so they sent Buddy and Issue 3 packing. Um, so, you know, one of the, the things we talk about is the, in, the impact of the industry, and so there's been this open question of, you know, will the industry take over, and ha you know, will it be like Big Tobacco 2.0? Well, for all, it seems like the industry basically has already taken over, and we can take this right from the legalization advocates themselves. Um, so uh, Dan Riffle, who is the federal was the federal policy director for the Marijuana Policy Project, recently resigned, um, and I included a couple of quotes and a link to the, the story. And basically, what he's saying is that the marijuana industry has taken over the legalization movement, and it's all about profits and about you know getting the best deal uh, for their for their industry. It's not about the philosophy of, of marijuana legalization. Um, so so he left, and so you know. And, he, and he's someone who still you know, strongly believes marijuana legalization is a good idea um, and somehow thinks that you can do that and protect public health. Um, but, but he doesn't want, he's out because the industry has taken over. So there doesn't really seem to be any question that the industry is definitely um, in the driver's seat. Um, and I wanted to include this. This initiative didn't, and didn't end up going forward in Colorado, but there was an initiative to put something on the ballot to allow uh, pot smoking in bars. So just as they've ushered out tobacco smoking out of their bars, here comes the marijuana legalization advocates to bring tobacco, uh, uh, marijuana smoke back in. So I think it's just another thing for us to be thinking about here in Maine, and you know, in that there's many different tentacles, and and um, from marijuana legalization, could we see that here? Could you know, if we, if we legalize, could we see you know initiatives to bring pot smoking uh, into our bars? and in other places. Um, so the next section uh, I wanted to talk about, share some of the data um, from Colorado. So, you know, they are the early the first state that kind of went out and put this really highly commercialized market out there. Um, and there's not, hasn't been a lot of data collection that's been going on, but there is this one group, uh, Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area that has produced, uh, at this point, three reports now that's gathered some of the initial public health, public safety data that they've been able to collect to really try to gauge the impact of commercialized marijuana on their state, um, again, primarily in terms of public health and, and public safety. So, you know, from, from, my, from what I can tell, this is really the only group that's doing this. Uh, you know, the state of Colorado does have some efforts to gather some uh, sort of financial uh, revenue kind of things, market studies, but um, this is really the only place where we're getting any kind of collection of the public health uh, data. And so I did include <coughs> um, a link here. I'm not sure if this is being emailed out later, but if, you, if, you, if this does go out, um, you'll be able to click on this link um, to, to go and see the reports. <coughs> so um, first section is looking at impaired driving. 
So um, in 2014, when it was basically when the marijuana businesses began operating the retail um, marijuana operation, I should say before that, in 2012 and before they, you know, they had their medical marijuana dispensaries. You know, in Colorado, the medical marijuana situation is much different than it is here in Maine. It's they're they're they have hundreds of dispensaries and supplies compared to the eight that we have here in statute. Um, this is almost like we have the inverse situation. They don't have all, all the caregivers that we have um, in Maine. They have a lot of these dispensaries instead. So they but they have a pretty commercialized uh, medical marijuana system there. Um, but anyway, in 2014, when the, the retail marijuana businesses became operating, there was a 32% increase in marijuana-related traffic deaths. So in just one year. Um, marijuana traffic deaths increased 92 percent from 2010 to 2014. At that same time, the period of all traffic death, deaths only increased 8 percent. So while they're seeing not, you know, while their overall um, traffic death situation in Colorado seems to be improving or at least, you know, slowing down within that, the, the percentage that are related to marijuana are, are increasing. Um, Youth marijuana use, I actually had to update this slide uh, last night with the new data, but um, so in 2013, they were at 11.16% amongst their 12 to 17 year olds, so uh, it's compared to 7% nationally. So at the, at the so then they were third in the nation and 56% higher uh, than the national average. So now with the latest 2014 data, we show, we see that they're now actually ranked number one. Um, just for information, Rhode Island previously was the number one state. Um, I think they're number two now. In fact, when you look at the top ten, all six of the New England states are, are in the top ten. I don't remember exactly where Maine is. I think we're at right around ten at this point. Um, another thing they're seeing around youth and marijuana is increasing issues around schools. So drug-related suspensions and expulsions increased 40 percent uh, between so before marijuana was commercialized to after. Um, and you know the vast majority of those are related to marijuana violations. We look at adult use. Um, so, 2013, 29 percent of college-age students, 18 to 25, were considered current marijuana users, compared to just under 19 percent. So, um, Colorado ranked second in the nation in that category. Um, and then when we look at 26 and over, a little over 10 percent, uh, compared to almost five and a half percent nationally. Uh, emergency room admissions. Um, so, 2014, after the retail shops opened, we saw a, Colorado saw a 29% increase in the number of marijuana-related emergency room visits in just one year. Um, marijuana-related hospitalizations increased 38% in that same time period. Um, and then I talked a little bit about this before: um, is the admissions for children, and many of these, if not all, are related to accidental ingestions. Um, but they went from just two um, to 16. So again, basically went to a virtually non-existent public health issue to a very significant one. So we can see the impact that um, commercialized marijuana has there. Um, I had a graph earlier that showed that talked about this, but the zero to five. Uh, marijuana-related exposures, and these are all, again, these accidental poisonings, many of which are related to the edibles that are either left out or not secured. Um, so during the years 2013-2014, average number of children exposed was 31 per year. Um, again, going back previously, it was less than 10. It was like around 4. So it's a 138% increase um, from the medical marijuana commercialization years to the retail. Um, so again, um, this shows the role that access and availability has on uh, public health. Um, all right, so this is last section I have is some policy resources that we're starting to see emerge from the other states. Again, a lot of these come from Colorado and Washington, which were the first two states to start this um, social experiment um, of, of marijuana legalization. Uh, we know other states have, have legalized since, Oregon and Alaska, um, as well as Washington, D.C., although in Washington, D.C., they don't have, they didn't legalize the, the sales, so it's a little bit different. So I think we'll, we'll find many more things to, uh, to learn from these, these states that are coming online. Um, but they are starting, they have started to work through some of the different policy issues that have come up, and there's some great 
resources that have been developed so far, so I wanted to kind of share these uh, for us to consider um, as marijuana legalization could potentially come to our state. And then, of course, even if it doesn't come, we still have our, our medical marijuana laws, and certainly there are some issues and challenges um, around that. Um, so as referenced earlier, one of the issues Colorado um, has been facing is the increase in marijuana-related traffic fatalities. Um, so one of the things that they've done is they've um, set a limit of five nanograms of active THC per milliliter of blood. Uh, and they also have their DRE system to detect impairment as well. Um, so here in Maine, you know, we have obviously the DREs, but we don't have um, we don't have that limit right now. So it's it's solely relying on the judgment of the DREs uh, for for the impairment. Um, so you know, that's one of the policy considerations that's under underway right now in Maine. There was a work group that was convened over the summer. To look at that, um, to look at how Maine is going to uh, to look at this um, in terms of marijuana impairment. Um, so Colorado has developed a marijuana and driving campaign, and there's a there's a link there, so you'll be able to visit that and see that. So um, again, I think you know, regardless if marijuana is legalized recreationally or not, um, there's a great resource here for Maine to to look at um, to develop our own campaigns here. Um, Marijuana youth in school. So I previously um, mentioned, you know, the commercialization, commercialization and availability of marijuana has caused increased issues at schools. Um, in fact, um, this first bullet comes from a recent news article. I think it was in the Denver Post um, or one of the newspapers out there. Is that they've been, in, you know, educators are identifying marijuana as the number one problem. So either marijuana is coming to schools or students are coming under the influence. Um, the increase in marijuana-related suspensions and expulsions. Um, so one of the things that Colorado is doing is they have an initiative to um, encourage schools to review and revise their school policies. Um, and there's actually a great resource here on some guidance they have issued, um, sort of model policies that schools can adopt. Um, and that's something that we're doing here in Maine with our, in general, with schools is encouraging to review and revise and make sure their school policies are current. Um, and so that's one of the considerations I think for Maine is to look at and to revise those school policies. So if you're with an HMP or a DSC and you're working with schools on school policies, I think it's something you'll want to um, include in that is making sure they're considering um, things like medical marijuana, you know, the e-cigarettes and the vaping devices, um, you know, both in terms of students, but also, you know, adults who may be coming to schools for different um, events. Um, I think it's good to have clear uh, guidelines that are current with the current state of substance use uh, in Maine. I think another thing to look at is ESPERT protocol. So that's uh, ESPERT stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. Um, basically, that's a protocol where you're doing some initial screening for someone who may be at risk. Um, and it provides an opportunity to someone who's maybe just sort of maybe experimenting or doesn't have a sniffing issue, it's a chance to kind of move them back down into either abstinence or a low risk situation. So looking at how we can um, use expert protocols um, to divert kids to education and other interventions. Um, I think codifying the use of evidence-based curriculum is another good thing to look at. So when we're doing prevention and education in schools or in other settings to make sure it's evidence-based. Um, and, um, you know, again, rules and line, guidelines and expectations for the conduct of, guest, of guests on school, at school events. Marijuana and young adults in colleges. Um, one of the interesting things um, in Colorado and in Washington is, you know, the, many of these colleges receive federal funding. So for all intents and purposes, marijuana is still illegal on their campus because they don't want to jeopardize their funding. But the issue is that many of the students coming to their colleges don't know that. Um, in fact, that's something you'll sometimes see is, you know, the something I've heard from, from legalization advocates is that legalization will lead, lead, to, lead to a big boon of students coming to college who want to have, you know, the marijuana experience along with their education. Um, but again, many students don't understand that many of these campuses are not going to allow it because of the federal funding. The second issue is that we hear a lot about in Colorado, the, the, all the money that's going to education. What they don't say is that that's, you know, that's primary, that's elementary, middle school, high school, that that funding is not going to colleges. So they have this increased, they have this challenge around, you know, communicating around the, 
federal and state law conflict, but they don't have any extra funding to do it. Um, so I think some policy considerations for, for Maine colleges is, you know, some training and technical assistance on the current laws that we already have uh, between medical marijuana and the, the federal marijuana laws. I think it's another opportunity to weave expert into, um, you know, college uh, health centers and, and similar settings. Um, and I think also looking at clear policies and communication of policies regarding on-campus and off-campus activities. So I think, you know, even with our current marijuana laws, I think it's it's good if, if a college doesn't have a clear policy and communication plan around that, it's probably a good idea to start looking at that. Um, and, the and then I provide an example here from Colorado College um, and their policy on marijuana. I uh, talked a little bit before about the issue around marijuana and pregnancy, um, and this is where the industry, unfortunately, is playing a role. I mean, Colorado, there was an initiative to require uh, warnings in the dispensaries, um, but uh, Colorado, uh, but the industry um, was successful in defeating that, so there's no warnings in, in the dispensaries. Um, in Washington, uh, marijuana purchasers do receive warnings, which include the, the state you see there. Um, so at least there, there are, there are some warnings and guidelines. Um, and then what they've done, the, the Colorado Department of Public Health has actually developed a um, program to provide some training uh, to healthcare providers around the risks um, that marijuana poses to pregnancy and, and breastfeeding. Uh, so, I, you know, again, uh, some, some policy considerations uh, Sam Main would sort of um, encourage is looking, requiring some screenings and consultations for women of childbearing age. Um, before a marijuana certification is issued, I think it's important that they understand the potential risks, um, require warnings on packaging and in dispensaries or caregiver sites, and training requirements for providers issuing certifications, again, to make sure that they're aware of the, si the current science we have around marijuana and pregnancy. And then did include, if you're not aware, um, our state office, SANS, has some really great uh, rack cards around pregnancy and, and breastfeeding. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with this last section and then go to questions. Um, so one of the things we, Sam Main has been accused of in the past and from, from legalization uh, advocates is, you know, we're just say no status quo. Um, so one of the projects we've been working on is developing some of our vision of, you know, we don't, we're not sure that legalization maybe is a good idea, but, you know, at the same time, as, as we mentioned with our goals, we do want to have these conversations about, where are there issues with our current marijuana policies in, in terms of stigma or creating barriers for people to get jobs and those sort of things. So we kind of created what our vision would be, sort of our third way approach to marijuana policy. Um, some ideas around criminal justice include possible education as an alternative for first time offenders. Um, right now, if you're um, where marijuana is decriminalized, if you're caught in possession of zero to two and a half ounces, it's a fine. Although when you get up to two and a half ounces, it can be a significant fine, upwards of I think six hundred, eight hundred dollars. So for someone of low income, that can be you know that can be significant. So maybe there's an um, opportunity to do some education instead. Um, some states have started to look at looking at sealing or expunging certain nonviolent, non-drug trafficking possession charges. And again, part of that is to provide an opportunity for folks to, you know, if they're in recovery or whatnot, to, you know, to get a job, to, to get an education, to make sure that one sort of mistake that they made isn't a, a significant barrier to them being able to, to, to move on with their lives. Um, looking at some nimbleness when it comes to possession charges of over two and a half ounces. And again, you know, if someone has a significant dependency, they're probably going to be using more, more of the drug to get the desired effect. So how can we distinguish between someone with a dependence issue and someone who's trafficking and just so we can provide some treatment and support for the per person with the addiction. Um, and then I think, you know, we definitely encourage the research and establishing of some kind of DUI limit for THC in Maine. So it's just so we, our law enforcement, enforcement folks can have some tools available to them. Um, I think looking at Maine's substance abuse portfolio, certainly looking at um, greater investment and in prevention treatment and recovery services, encouraging use of SBIRT in medical uh, settings and other settings. Um, and then, you know, around work sites and recovery, we, want, we would like to see some support and training services and resources for individuals in recovery with nonviolent drug offenses. Again, allow our people an opportunity to get back to work, to get an education. Um, you know, that shouldn't be a, a barrier that prevents them from, from moving on. Um, 
perhaps some tax incentives or other incentive programs for employers who hire applicants who are in recovery, not just for marijuana, but for, for any, any substance. Uh, and then pass to employment for individuals who, who fail drug tests who may otherwise be, be qualified. So again, it's, I think the idea here is, you know, folks make, can make mistakes and, and, you know, we just think those shouldn't saddle them for, for the rest of their lives and so looking at opportunities to, for them to have pathways to, uh, to, to, to sort of turn their lives around. Um, so that's about all I have. I did want to share some resources here. Um, the main office of substance abuse and mental health, mental health services has some great um, uh, resources around marijuana. National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, certainly Smart Approaches to Marijuana has a lot of great information. And then uh, Rocky Mountain Haida, again, if you're interested to get more in-depth um, data on what's going on in Colorado, that's a great uh, resource. Um, I did want to plug blogs and social media. So as, as uh, Tina mentioned, I am doing this blog at um, the Bangor Daily News. I try to do it weekly. Um, some weeks I do better than others. Um, so check that out. I actually have a new article up today that's actually talking about the, the, uh, the heroin issue. Um, I don't just blog about marijuana. Um, Sam Main has a couple of social media pages. We're on Facebook and Twitter. And then I also have my own Twitter account, um, which, I, which is fairly active, so you can follow me there. And then my contact information, um, if, uh, I know we're going to do some questions here, but if we don't get to your question or if you have, something comes up afterwards, please feel free to reach out to me. If it's a Sam question, um, I would encourage you to use my Gmail account. Um, otherwise, you can reach me um, at AdCare. So that, I think we can open it up. Two questions. Scott, thank you so much. Scott, thank you so much. I think when we both are unmuted, there's probably some feedback. Probably some feedback. So uh, let, me, let me mute. I just want to know if you can see the questions, and if you can't, I will read them out. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not seeing the questions. Okay, if you want to mute yourself, we'll kind of take turns muting yep. and unmuting. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, Scott. That was um, really great information. I'm not only glad we could present it to other people, but I'm glad that I could join as well and and learn more about this topic. Um, there's um, a, a lot to learn, it seems, a lot of data to continue to gather, and um, a lot of different directions we need to be thinking about to keep our uh, youth and adults safe. Um, so the first question is from Patty, and she asks, does the same impairment occur in low THC products used for medical purposes? Um, I mean, I think it's going to vary. I mean, so there are, there are some medical uh, Medical marijuana products that are either just CBD, and that's uh, I'm not going to be able to spit that one out. But that's the non-psycho one of the nine non-psychoactive um, cannabinoids, um, and may, maybe very low THC. So I, I think it's it's going to be different. But again, I do have to you know the caveat is um, from from one of the beginning slides. It is going to depend a lot on the person. Um, so you know, low THC may not have any impact. Um, on, on a certain person, but it may have a significant impact on another person. So there is going to be some some variation. Um, but I mean, I think certainly apples to apples, you know, something that's lower in THC compared to something, I mean, I think it would be similar to alcohol. But then again, there's always also that risk if someone thinks something is low potency, do they overuse? You know, do they sort of, and um, so, I guess it's sort of a very many asterisks in that answer. So I, so I think potentially, yes, it, it probably wouldn't have the same amount of impairment, but again, it's going to depend somewhat on the user um, and sort of how, you know, how much, how much they're using it. And they're just their individual body composition and reaction to marijuana. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Um, and if you, if anyone has a follow-up question, you can type it in now. You can also raise your hand and we can try to unmute you. Um, the next set of questions is from Brian Piper, who um, has a couple of different questions. Brian, I'm not sure we can comment on um, the, your, your 
second question, I guess, was about a recent, or I don't know if it's recent. No, it's not recent, actually. Uh, paper, you, you, you reference a couple of different papers that have come out um, over the last six years or so, um, and referencing Maine is in the middle of an opioid and, op and, and opioid overdose epidemic. Do you have any thoughts on uh, this paper? And you list a couple of different papers. Um, I'm not sure um, it's fair to ask Scott to react to something that, um, a, you know, a journal article that he may or not have read. So may or may not have read. So um, Scott, maybe I will make sure you can see that question and we can get back to Brian um, in a, a different medium might make more sense. Uh, his other um, question was more of a comment. Um, talking about the youth use in Maine, noted that no significant changes were stati statistically significant, but he was suggesting it might be worth double checking those 2013 and 2015 um, comparisons because even small differences will be significant if not clinically significant. So I don't know if Scott, you want to know. Scott, you about want that? Uh, well, I yeah, when when you when you look at the the rates on when you factor in the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval, and I'm sorry, I, my statistical jargon is uh, making my eyes glaze over. But um, so, so when you when you compare the the numbers, there there is no statistically significant difference. It's, it's statistically flat, um, and that's that, uh, that that comes from the the folks who did the survey. They would would come to the same conclusion. So um, there is, you know, looking at the data, there is no statistical variation. Um, between 2013 um, and 2015. In fact, we actually, when you compare it back to 2009, the first time the survey was um, put out, it's the same thing. There's no statistical variation between up or down um, from 2009 uh, to 2015. And, but I mean, what's significant about that, though, is that the fact that all of our other substances, whether you compare, so first of all, we look at 2015 to 2013, underage drinking is down. Statistic, in a statistically significant way. Same thing with tobacco, same thing with uh, youth prescription drug abuse. We've made inhalant abuse. Um, pretty much every substance we've been working on, that HMPs and DSCs have been working on, those have been trending down. The one thing that's remained stubbornly flat, it hasn't gone up, thankfully, but it has not changed, is marijuana. And, you know, marijuana is the only substance right now that currently has a political campaign. Uh, behind it. So um, I think that's significant. Um, and I think we're definitely seeing normalization play. I happen to know that SAMS will be coming out with some um, technical reports that will compare past 30 day use and some risk factors. And um, I have, and I got sort of a preview of that the other day. And when those come out, what we're going to see is that the big factors are access and availability. So those kids who say marijuana is easy to get are, I forget the number, it's like seven or eight times more likely to have used in the past 30 days. Those who have a low perception of risk, that same kind of number. So, I mean, it's pretty clear that the impact that normalization, access and availability have on the use of marijuana. Um, and, and it's just the, the difference between those who had those risk factors and don't and the, the level of use is, I mean, it's very startling. It's very, it's very distinct. So. Um, I, I really don't think there's any question of the role that that's played. Yeah, thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Um, uh, everyone has Scott's, all his different, the various methods of getting a hold of Scott. Um, Scott, would you mind flipping it to the next slide? So, um, oop, there we go. Oop, now you're at the beginning. <laughs> Anyhow, while Scott's um, going to the end there, I just wanted to highlight the next webinar in our series, which is January 20th at, 20th at noon, around sharing, shared community health needs assessment, um, creating the story about our data. I think it's going to be another great webinar. Um, so hopefully folks will um, be interested in attending that through the registration link on uh, your screen right now. We will, uh, this webinar has been recorded. We will archive this webinar and have it available um, for folks on the line as well as folks who couldn't join today. 
Um, and in the meantime, I just want to thank you, Scott, once again for um, taking this time and joining us today and providing us all this um, wonderful information that we will certainly be able to use now and, uh, and into the future. So um, thanks again. Well, um, thanks again. Hope everybody have a great has a great day.